Thank you very much. Uh, good morning and welcome to our session this morning. An Instagram is worth a thousand words. Uh, just a quick reminder at the beginning, if you do have a mobile phone device, it would be a good idea to keep it switched on and in the silent mode because we do have live polling throughout the panel session. Um, I will introduce all of our panel members first before beginning our discussion. On my extreme left is Christian Bowman. Christian has been helping organisations for over 12 years to develop and execute digital strategy, utilise data and integrate technology to communicate more effectively. As the Internet Marketing Manager at Bond since 2010, Christian developed the university-wide strategy in rolling out over 22 social media profiles as a part of their wider digital strategy. On my left is Inga van Dyck, a professional wildlife photojournalist and expedition leader. Inga divides her time between Australia, Africa, the Himalayas and Antarctica. Spanning 13 years, her professional career has seen her travelling to some of the most remote locations on Earth, where she has worked photographing conservation projects, endangered wildlife and indigenous cultures. She has judged national photographic competitions and was awarded a commendation in the International iPhone Photography Awards in 2012. Inga is a guest lecturer in photojournalism at Bond University. On my close right is Joe Hare. Joe is a new librarian, having joined the profession only six months ago. She is enthusiastic about the opportunities that social media presents for libraries and introduced the Bond Library Instagram account as a way of trying something different in the library and to complement the library's existing social media. On the left of Joe is Peter Hopkins. Peter is an IT project manager, librarian and social media aficionado. With a keen interest in innovation, Peter has developed an extensive number of usernames and acquired a heap of mobile apps. As an executive member of the Gold Coast Social Media Club for some years, she shared her knowledge and experiences with both the local and online communities. And on my extreme left is Mitchell Willis. Mitchell is a Bond University... On oh, my extreme right, sorry. <laughs> Is a, a Mitchell is a Bond University student studying a combined bachelor's degree of law and business and is an avid Instagram user in both personal and business spheres. With a creative flair due to his background in multimedia design, Mitchell utilises Instagram to raise awareness in his roles of IT and multimedia director for the Bond University Student Association, promotions director for the Bond University Business Students Association and president of both the Bond University Creative Collective and Bond Marketing Group. Mitchell has also headed up several student political marketing campaigns with Instagram being the primary tool. We have three broad discussion areas for our topic for our discussion today, which will be prefaced by a live poll, which will give audience feedback and some participation. The, each poll will be followed by a panel discussion and we'll have question and answers from the audience at the, end of our, at the end of our session. To begin, we'll play a short little video explaining Instagram, introducing it and introducing Bond's use. Okay, so we've got a practice poll here to get us used to the idea of the, the live polling. 
Uh, the question that, that, that you can uh, ask is, uh, answer is, do you take photos with your mobile device? There are a number of ways you can respond to this. Uh, beside the answers yes or no, you can see a code. You can either text that keyword to the phone number plus 61429883481. You can tweet at poll with the keyword beside it. Or submit a response to the website listed there with the, with the code number. While that's working, I just want to read out some stats on student use of Instagram, uh, of uh, uh, photos. At the end of 2012, Instagram passed Twitter in daily active users on, my, on mobile for the first time. Instagram had 7.3 million daily mobile users for the month, while Twitter had 6.9 million. Further, Twitter's visitors spent less time on average viewing content than visitors to Instagram. According to a survey of university students in America, taking photos is the third most common type of content students produce on their smartphones, third only to texting and email. It seems there's an overwhelming majority that shares photos on online devices. Okay, it takes photos on online devices. We'll move on to the next poll then to begin the discussion. Do you share your mobile photos online? If so, where? On Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Flickr, another site, or you don't share photos online? You can text the keyword again to the phone number plus 6142988 Tweet at poll with the appropriate keyword and submit your response at the website that is listed there. Well, it seems that Facebook and Instagram, two aligned companies, have, have the, the lion's share of, of, mobile, um, uh, of mobile sharing there. I want to start the discussion then with, a, with, with the question, what are people actually doing when they're sharing an image? If someone shares a photo with you via a hashtag or a geolocation, what does that image mean? What are they trying to say? I'll open up with this question to Christian. Uh, thanks, Daniel. So um, I know that from my point of view, when I post stuff up, um, uh, there is a level of ego around it. So whether it's um, if I hashtag a certain... Um, uh, photo, then I'm actually trying to align myself to other people who might be um, hashtagging something similar. Um, in terms of geotagging, definitely I'd probably tag myself if I'm at a fancy restaurant, fancy hotel. I'm less likely to tag when I'm in the toilet at home. So um, in saying that, I'm, there's probably people that do that. And they probably connect with other people doing the same thing and they probably have a wonderful life sharing their stories. And so um, I think um, from that point of view, people are trying to connect with others that are in similar situations. Um, there is that um, documentation side of things, so capturing um, events. Um, and they may not actually be significant events. Um, everything that you capture is you know, somewhat important to someone. Um, and then I think uh, from you know, hashtag point of view, um, there's also this underlying conversation. So you might have seen weird hashtags that are out there. It's almost like the in-between-the-lines um, sort of statement. So it might be, um, you know, uh, this is a great conference, hashtag um, so hungry right now, could eat a horse. So basically indicating that, that um, they're hungry. Hmm. Fantastic. And I'll bring in Mitchell for the student perspective here. What are people doing when they're sharing a hashtag or a geolocation? Well, from a student's perspective, it's definitely a way to communicate that's more engaging. And for example, if, uh, if I'm really disliking the lecture I'm currently sitting in, I could have my friend take a picture of me making a sad face and put a very ominous effect on it and, um, and, hash and hashtag the name of the subject and then um, something like sad times. And that's, that's a very university thing to do uh, at the moment. I see it all the time. And, um, and that's... Uh, what that does is uh, if people click on the subject, they can see everybody else who has is, who is hashtagged that subject and they can, they can see all the miserable people in that lecture <laughs> <laughs> who, who should currently be learning, but clearly they're not. And, um, and you can also click on the, the other hashtag, which would be sad times, and, um, and see people all over the world who are currently feeling the same emotion as you. So I think it's... Um, it's a very different way to uh, communicate with others uh, in, in a way that you could be recommending something through uh, your hashtag as an emotion or you could be complaining about the situation you're in. 
Well, I know that Peter wants to say something about recommendations and, and Instagram, so I'll throw this one to Peter. Thank you. Um, yes, I think definitely that wanting to share experiences in terms of either a positive or, re or negative recommendation about places or events is something that a lot of Instagrammers do. Um, and it may be something like, you know, this is a great hotel that I'm staying at in Paris or, um, you know, don't bother eating at this restaurant, it's awful. And actually sharing that geolocation enables other users to find it perhaps um, and then link through to, say, Google Maps, look it up on Google Maps, go to Street View and actually have a really close look at, well, what is that place? What is so good about it? Why is it bad? Would I like to stay there as well? So I think it's quite powerful with the geolocations and the hashtags to be able to, um, you know, share what's good or bad about things in an active way. It's funny how um, dramatic people can get as well with the hashtag ends, like, uh, this hotel doesn't have a pillow menu, worst hotel ever, <laughs> or um, hashtag first, um, first world problems. Yes. So, yeah. Okay, well that begs the question then, why do people even spend time on Instagram to begin with? Christian? Um, I think it's, uh, it's quite simple. Um, I know that um, I went to a conference where there was a speaker called BJ Fogg from Stanford, um, behavioural scientist professor, and um, it was his students that actually created um, Instagram. And so the whole philosophy behind it was um, helping people do what they already want to do. Um, and that's, if you think about Instagram, people love taking pictures with their phone, and then they also love to share and also love to connect with others. And so from that point of view, it fulfills the job. And I think from um, a use perspective, um, they're exactly the, the sort of characteristics that people want out of a, um, a social media product. Okay, then. So what is significant about communicating via images alone? without text or HTML. Jo? Um, I think the, the significance is that you, you can't explain your image, so your image has to be entirely expressive. It needs to express the message that you're trying to communicate. I think for the library, uh, I certainly know that there's been a lot of literature written about using Facebook to construct an identity for the library, to make the library seem approachable, uh, not just to promote events and resources, but to make it seem like the, the library is uh, an enjoyable place for students to be. And I think uh, Instagram is really powerful in that respect because you can just snap a few photos in the library, show what's going on. Uh, maybe the photos will be funny so students don't view the library as being intimidating. Um, and it's an opportunity to, to construct an identity uh, through social media. Okay, I think this is an important question to ask Inga as the professional photographer. What um, is significant? Okay, with images as opposed to words, I think in, in a world that we have now, we're, we're constantly flooded with information. Uh, if you look everywhere in the world, um, on television you're getting short messages, you're getting tweets, and so forth. And people look at these things as a, su a succession of pieces, of small pieces of information. Now, um, to, as a library, um, generally libraries are sort of considered as a little bit of a dry... I'm sorry if this offends anyone. Um, <laughs> There's no librarians place. around, is there? <laughs> <laughs> Go on. It's a bit of a dry place and a place of necessity. And so um, it's, uh, if you start to use visual imagery as a, play, as a way to actually get people into the library and make it um, a little bit more of an engaging kind of place, I think you're going to get a bigger sort of... like a crowd following in libraries. Um, if you... People, imagery by and large is always going to re, like retain more impact. So if you've actually got um, imagery over just a piece of text, um, people are going to go back to it generally. They, they sort of think about it a lot more from a visual perspective. For example, these three images here. These are three very, very iconic images. If you were to look down a line of tweets and you said, oh, there's another civil uprising in China, well, people just go, oh, well, so, you know, like that happens all the time. But then you look at the tank guy and so forth, and people go, well, <laughs> and it makes people think twice. Um, same thing with the napalm girl in Vietnam. Um, napalm was uh, first used as a chemical weapon in Vietnam. And again, people weren't really sort of sure of the impacts of it. And why, why would they even be involved with it? Because it's, it's in Vietnam, most people don't see it. It's a time of conflict. They're not, it's not until they see a girl running from the effects of Vietnam naked with her clothes off that she can't stand the heat that, um, that people have that really impactful sort of, um, sort of memory of, of what happens, happens there. And again, the Afghan girl was another classic example. She, um, if you were to just read a hashtag of something, or read a, a, a feed like saying, oh, there's um, stunning diversity of people in, in Afghanistan. Well, okay, yeah, so what does that mean exactly? I mean, you know, um, and then you see her face and think, 
just with very confronting sort of eyes and beautiful irises and, and so forth. And, and people remember this a lot more. So if you're using photos to engage a crowd in a library, if you've got particularly good quality content going through Instagram, you're going to get a much, much wider following as opposed to people just looking at this place and going, oh, I've got to go and get that book out. I've got to go and return the book or whatever. <laughs> so it's, yeah. Okay. So then that leads me to the more refined question of how can Instagram be used in an educational setting? Jo, I think you've got an example. Uh, I do have an example. Um, these are some <laughs> pictures taken from the Instagram feed of a, a primary school. The, the school actually shares, uh, not the school, sorry, one class shares a, an Instagram account. And the teacher in the class uses Instagram for the students to reflect on their learning, take images of work that they've done. They use it to um, share what they're doing, to collaborate and to communicate about um, between each other and, and with their families and friends that follow them on Instagram. It's an opportunity for them to share, share their learning um, in a social media context. Okay. Peter, do you have any opportunities to mention? Yes, um, certainly. In the obvious ones that spring to mind, of course, art and photography courses, but taking us, you know, a step aside from that, other sorts of ideas that I've, I've read about are things like asking students to create a photo essay to illustrate something that they've learned, and then tying things that they've learned in theory to real life experiences to illustrate them. And, and it could even be in mathematics. We're learning about fractions, we're learning about parallel lines. Go out and take photos of those things to, so that we can see that you understand it or just to reinforce those sorts of learnings. Um, the same thing with vocabulary words. So, you know, where's your spelling list? Here are some things, you know, how do you spell disgusting? Well, do you know what it means? Take a picture of your face when you're feeling disgusted. What does that look like? So, so there's all sorts of ways, I think, that it can be brought into um, educational experiences. I'll just show um, another example as well. Actually, this is from uh, a project called Spartans Will 360 from University of Michigan. And they're using Instagram, they're integrating Instagram into their existing website. Uh, and they're using it to promote the research that they do around the world. So they've had a group of staff and students that have traveled all over the world to visit various research projects. I think it's a really powerful way of, um, you know, create, of storytelling with their research, not just talking to people about it, but showing people what, what research is being done. Okay. Mitchell, what other opportunities are there for Instagram as an educational tool? Um, well, I, I believe that uh, definitely has the potential for all libraries to use in a way um, where they create engaging content that's educating to all the students. And um, there's, um, there's a very good possibility that uh, utilising a social network to communicate with students who are probably more often on it than, um, than other student services at the university when they should be studying, um, you, you're able to remind them that, um, that they go here and uh, give them, I guess, uh, tips and that engaging content to sometimes remind them that they might need to go to the library and um, when they need to return that book by having an Instagram that explains how long they can borrow things for. And um, ad another thing uh, that libraries could definitely do is, um, is rather than taking a photo, uh, they, could, they could use uh, somebody who knows uh, how to use Photoshop and create something simple uh, like a, a TransLink super simple tips, um, but for the libraries. So it's um, being, being polite in the library or how to, how to actually care for the books you've borrowed. borrowed. So it's something that, um, something that definitely can be used to have a positive impact on the students and the library as a whole. Fantastic. That's a, a good point to move on to our next poll and our next discussion topic. The next poll question is, what is the biggest concern to consider when the library joins a new social network? Privacy issues, it's taking up too much time, how to measure its success, or not having engaging content to share. Once again, there's keywords there. You can either text them to the number listed, tweet at poll with the keyword, or submit the response at the listed website there. I think Joe has a good example of a, 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 an issue with joining Instagram with a student at McDonald's. Do, yes. I think I'll just jump over to that slide now. So it seems like privacy issues are time consuming are definitely concerns and, and that was a concern for, for Bond as well when we started using Instagram in the library. I'll show you the examples um, that we found when we started using Instagram. 
Um, these are some of the photos that were shared uh, both directly and indirectly with the libraries. Uh, all of these were geotagged at Bond University Library so we could go to the location and see these photos. Um, but the McDonald's example was actually deliberately shared with us. It was tagged with a Bond Library hashtag which was you know, a conscious decision to make sure that we saw that photo. Um, so I guess you kind of have to think about when you see these, these sorts of images, what, what do they mean and what are the students telling us? Does it mean that our, our message about not eating in the library isn't getting across or does it mean that, that <laughs> students don't care? And I think maybe it's an, it's an opportunity to get that sort of feedback and to, you know, it's an opportunity to, not to listen to students, but to see what actually goes on in your library and then Instagram provides an opportunity to, to respond to that. I think this also maybe indicates um, maybe a perception, and this might be a generalisation among students, that the library isn't present in those social media um, spheres, that they're not aware that, that we're watching it, um, which that's just a thought. <laughs> well, that brings up the question of uh, Instagram faux pas, people having a lack of awareness about privacy or uh, uh, some other things they should or should not be doing. Inga, what are the Instagram faux pas? Well, I I don't know, with all of your Instagram users, you'll know that when you actually switch on your Instagram, you see a feed of, of images. And, and the thing is that, uh, like, what you're really looking to do as a library is trying to get users engaged. And so it's not so much a, a, a faux pas thing per se, it's actually sort of like what actually engages people and what doesn't towards your library. And uh, when you look at a feed um, that constantly has things like selfies, um, where guys are sort of like going and taking photos of themselves and it's like, it, it sort of gets a bit narcissistic and a bit old hat. Um, other things like food, um, clouds out the airplane window, pieces of rubbish and, and trying to be arty. I mean, <coughs> unfortunately, this is the sort of subject matter that crops up a lot in feeds and so forth. And it's so often that, that people don't engage with it anymore. So it's, it's it can be nowhere near as effective as if you've got someone who's, who's got a little bit of a, a creative eye and who can actually follow some rules of photography and actually sort of like maybe take a photo of someone reading a book at the end of a, a line of, uh, at the end of two lines of books or something, like they're sitting at reading and, and they've got a contemplative look in their face. Far more engaging sort of content um, than, than actually things that are just going to be their random sort of stuff that you sort of see. You know, people, you know, the more, the more you put engaging content, the more um, you're going to get a following. And, that, and that's really what you're after. Yeah, you're not after someone who's just going to sit there and just post random stuff um, through, you know, and, and things in a library. Well, I, know, <laughs> I know that Christian posts food. Sorry. 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 It's making me hungry. <laughs> <laughs> Continue. Sorry. We'll get another side of this then. Christian, what do you think some Instagram photos Well, I know that be? from, um, I share different things to each of my different social networks and so um, online. And I think um, other people who use uh, Instagram have almost this false sense of security where, um, well, maybe it's not a false sense of security, it's probably more of an, um, a misunderstanding of, of how it all wo works. So there is one example of um, someone that I subscribe to, and oh, the, what I'm going to tell you next isn't the reason why I'm subscribed to her. Um, <laughs> she, um, she contributes to a hashtag called Naked Tuesdays. Um, every Tuesday, um, uh, Instagram users around the world will take a picture of them naked but creatively covering up their bits. Um, whether it's watermelons or, um, you know, but usually they're doing domestic activities, so it's actually quite entertaining. Um, and, that I, yeah. So, um, <laughs> somehow I got distracted in my thoughts just then. Um, but when, um, I know that this person also is, uh, I'm friends with them on Facebook, but they don't post it on Facebook. And so for some reason, it seems safer for her to post it publicly on Instagram as opposed to privately with her closed network within Facebook. So that's an interesting sort of, um, you know, uh, dilemma in terms of um, their, I would imagine their understanding. Um, I think um, students may definitely, because even, the, you know, when we're thinking about it logically, students are tagging um, the location, they're hashtagging the university, um, and then they're making direct comments, and it's obviously in the picture that they're at a lo location on campus. Um, are they actually deliberately trying to let us know that they're eating McDonald's, or are they actually just trying to connect with others on campus to let them know that they've broken the rules and they're so cool and they're eating McDonald's? So, you know, you can look at it a couple of different ways. Okay. Well, this brings up the issues of the Instagram's terms of service for privacy. Um, 
What do these recent changes to Instagram terms of service and privacy policy mean uh, for educators and libraries? Mitchell, you've done some research in this area. Can you share some thoughts? Yeah, well, uh, if, when uh, following Instagram changing both the terms of service and privacy policy, um, there, was, there was quite an uproar around uh, the Instagram community uh, because they, they added a clause which, uh, which allowed um, them to use people's photographs that they've taken to advertise the service. So um, uh, that was in news media as well as on quite a few online blogs um, in recent times. Um, but I don't believe uh, this, is, this is an issue that generally concerns uh, libraries directly, uh, but there are it, the terms of service and privacy policy are, um, are very important things to consider when you're going to start an Instagram account, and uh, I, I do highly recommend that um, that you print that you print both um, both the agreements out because um, because in the end, creating an account, you are automatically agreeing to what is in these, and uh, a lot of the time, you need to read uh, your rights and responsibilities as. Um, as I guess a business entity um, towards your, your students. Uh, the terms and conditions are the same for both people and entities. So um, it's, uh, it's really good to remember that. And um, there are a couple of things. Uh, one clause that I would note is that you can upload unlawful content, which could be defaming imagery. So um, you must always ask people um, if you're going to publish a photo of them because they may feel that that photo doesn't portray them in the best light or they shouldn't be in that location at that particular time and they could come back and potentially make claims against you in the future. But obviously, if you um, are responsible and always, um, and always remember the terms of service, you can definitely, um, you can yeah. definitely use it as a very um, simple service to market um, the library. Okay, well, the terms of service did change and were very well publicised. Peter, what impact did they have on the growth of users in Instagram? Well, apparently very little um, impact. Uh, initially, there was a huge uproar and there were a number of Instagram users who signed off from Instagram and declared they weren't going to use it ever again, that their photos were their own. Um, and their sign-off images that they posted were quite often a thumbs down or something even more <laughs> offensive than that, perhaps. Um, thumbs sideways? No, I think... Or is it a different finger? Go on. It was a different finger. Um, so, so that was quite amusing for a while, but really it didn't seem to have very much impact on, in terms of Instagram use. Certainly Instagram responded and said that they were going to reverse some of the changes that they had outlined. Um, CMS Wire reported not long after that that um, Instagram users were uh, had gone up to 90 million monthly active users in the following month following it, which is a still 10% growth. So maybe some people did sign off, maybe others said, oh, what's this Instagram thing, and immediately started posting to it. Okay, so then what are the specific risks for libraries when using Instagram? Jo? I think the risks are probably similar to other social media that the libraries might already be using. I think Mitchell uh, touched on it if you're going to be taking photos of people, not just your patrons, but your staff, you always need to uh, ask for permission and just make sure that they're comfortable and they know what you're going to use the image for. Um, but I think in general with Instagram, it's just about having a social media policy that you would have for Facebook or Twitter or your blog and just being aware of the guidelines that you have in place for, for that account and the use of that account. I think that's especially important if you've got more than one person using the account. At the moment, it's only me that uses the Bond Library account, um, so I know what I'm doing, but it's important to... Well, I don't always know what I'm doing, but it's important <laughs> to have that written down so um, other people in the, in the organisation can be aware of that as well. Um, I think also the, the changes to the terms of service and the privacy policy, even though they created a bit of an uproar, I think that it was kind of interesting because it got people talking about their privacy online and as Christian touched on people maybe don't have don't necessarily have an understanding of the different different privacy settings across different social media networks so it almost provides an opportunity to talk to your students about about privacy online and how how they're being perceived online okay well Mitchell how would you feel as a student being watched by the library on Instagram um, well I think it's a it's a very interesting concept to think of um, 
like uh, I guess this is a business and um, in a sense and staff members uh, are using a social network that you're also connected to and it's a very public one so any user on Instagram can see anybody else's pictures it's very interesting so it's almost the opposite of Facebook you don't really connect to people you just start following the people you choose um, so um, so I guess students have to be careful now if they're going to uh, take a picture of them, like on Instagram of them having having lunch at a local restaurant when they should be in the tutorial they're missing, and that <laughs> like uh, it isn't really a privacy concern because um, all all the users of Instagram Instagram have uh, agreed to the terms of service and anyone can use it and a university has every right to. Uh, to use it in any way they see fit to market or to monitor. Well, I'll throw this one to Christian then. What are the privacy boundaries with your followers? How far should you delve into your followers' um, profiles? So that picture that we had up of the McDonald's and the, um, the library, um, did, did we have one up where the student was having a nap on one of the tables? Yeah. In the, I don't know how she <laughs> thought that was comfortable. But I think that um, you can be a bit creative with it. So as opposed to reprimanding them publicly in front of all of their, all of your followers and their followers, um, you can be a bit creative with it. So obviously, if they're eating McDonald's, um, there may be you can either take it as feedback that maybe we need to get some hot, hot chips at, in, in our <laughs> cafe, or you might um, you can be creative and put up a post saying um, the benefits of eating healthy. Or um, if a student's having a nap somewhere, then um, you know maybe you could put up a post something along the lines of nearest hotels or um, things like that. So. Um, <laughs> I think you can be creative with it. Um, you're engaging in the discussion, um, and it's not uh, projecting a, a an agenda or a um, you know terms of of use sort of thing. And I guess it's important to sort of keep a sense of humour about it. You are maybe going to see some stuff that yeah. you don't want to see. You know what'd be funny is <laughs> the staff members having a nap in each of their cubicles <laughs> and then posting that up. <laughs> that would be good. <laughs> well, that's a good point to bring up our next panel discussion topic with the next poll. With the Bonds Library's Instagram account, which category of images do you think received the most likes? The library's photos of the library staff, promoting resources and events, day-to-day -day going on, or behind the scenes? You can either text the appropriate code to the number 614-988-3481, tweet <laughs> at poll. When, um, as we were taking photos on Instagram, We've taken about 100 and we broke them into, into categories just to, so we could see if there was any sort of correlation between what was the most popular with students. And we'd read a lot about what kind of content we should be sharing, what would be engaging, and a lot of what we read was to share photos of your staff and of people in the library, and we expected that to be the most popular category. Um, but actually, it's kind of a cheeky question because there wasn't really any consistency. The, the photos were all generally popular. There wasn't one particular category. Um, that stood out. I've got a few examples of our most liked photos on Instagram. So that, that meme in the top corner, that got 22 likes. That, I suppose that doesn't sound like a lot, but we only have a very small student body, so 22 likes uh, for us is actually very big. Um, we shared that meme on Facebook at the exact same time and it only got one like. Um, so we were obviously getting a lot more engagement on, um, on Instagram than we were in Facebook. Um, obviously food um, is, is popular, um, that's a photo that we took one day, we, we were attending a uh, library exhibition at the University of Queensland and that was also very popular, so I think I'm guilty of a lot of the faux pas that, <laughs> that Inga talked about, um, maybe we'll... Um, you are you as resident photographer for okay. the library. I'll come in well, I need, to, I need to ask Inga then, what sort of images are engaging? Yeah, well, on, on Instagram you see a plethora of images and a lot of people are, are, are turning, into, turning it into an art form of itself, um, which is really quite nice. But you, you will find, even though it's a square format, that the general rules of photography will still hook people in. Um, things like the rule of thirds, leading lines, um, general creativity, stuff that's relatable um, to most people. I, um, these, are from, these images particularly are from some friends of mine. Um, two of them are professional photographers. One's just a professional Instagram, and Yanis, the guy at the bottom, is just that's all he does is Instagram. And his work is just fantastic because it's, it's very engaging. Some of his work is very simple. It doesn't need to be a very complex image in order for it to draw somebody in. Yes, it, it, it just needs to be, you know, something that is, is completely relatable to most people that are there. Um, 
So yeah, uh, if, if, when you're in the library, for example, if you if you've got someone who's just sort of like, um, you know, you could you, you could shoot any any sort of number of different images, like you know, different books, which actually borderline is a bit of a borderline copyright issue, or you could actually get someone who's very good with depth of field. So say that you've, you're looking through a, a, a shelf of books to another person on the other side and so forth, and the book's slightly obscured on, on the top and bottom and you've got someone who's in, in focus in the middle and a, a reader. Um, yeah, that's going to be a far more engaging image than just you know a line of books along the shelf or, or whatever. Um, and especially if, if someone actually in a university setting can recognise that reader as one of their friends and so forth. And that not only will they like the image, they'll probably share it on Facebook and do all sorts of things like that too. And that's what you're looking for. You're looking for an engaged community. And in, and, and in particularly with this sort of thing, um, it's, it's very much a case of quantity, uh, quality over quantity. Um, it's, you're going to get far more people who are sort of engaged through really, really good quality images than you will through to someone who just shares 50 of them a day. Well, I'm going to have to interrupt you there to Sorry. ask a very controversial question. Do librarians have the visual literacy skills to make engaging content? Joe? Uh, I, think, I think yes. Maybe not in the way that Inga's talking. Like, I don't have any knowledge of the rules of photography or, or any of that sort of thing, but I think that's kind of the charm of Instagram, that it is so simple to use. Um, it's very easy to take a picture, put a filter on it. Uh, you can make it look really engaging without a whole lot of effort and maybe without... I think having those photography skills is definitely an advantage, but it doesn't, if you don't have them, it doesn't mean that you can't get involved and start using Instagram. I think as well, it's not just Instagram, some of the other photography apps that you can use that I think Kim will be talking about, um, they make it really easy as well to create engaging content. And I think, if, from my own experience, it's been quite empowering because it's allowed me, I've taken a lot of photos through Instagram that I've then used it in our print materials, you know, to create bookmarks or um, to promote events that are in the library. Um, they've gone up in the digital signage in the library as well. So I think, yeah, I think it can be empowering for maybe people that don't have those photographies. Can I, okay. can I just... I think we should hear from Peter on this one. Oh, OK, yeah. Yep. running yep. out of time. <laughs> I was, no. <laughs> um, I just, would just like to add in there, I think that, you know... A, at a particularly small library, there may not be someone who has a, you know, a talent for photography or artistic um, bent at all, but um, you know, the diversity of personal interests amongst librarians is the same as in any other um, industry or sector. And the advantage that librarians have is that they possibly have the best access to information resources for learning something new, developing skills in a particular area. So if they don't have it now, there's no reason why they won't. Okay. So how does someone know if their Instagram efforts are successful? How do we judge success? Is it by likes or followers? By changed behaviour of students? Christian? <laughs> um, oh, for me, if, if you go into, um, into it with some clear objectives, whether it's getting people to either engage more with the library as in turning up physically to the library, using different services, um, or if your goal is just to get lots of likes so that um, you can build on that in terms of following, then um, just be clear in setting those goals up front. So um, I think you know um, there are tools that you can do, um, do this with, but just set objectives at the start and just see if you meet them. For a final comment then, I'm going to ask the panel to give very brief answers to the following question. What is the future of Instagram? Is it here to stay? Okay, so start with me. I, it's definitely going to stay, and I think it's going to evolve. Um, and I think the way that um, hashtags um, uh, are used definitely needs to evolve. It's, it's not quite there yet. There's easier ways that it can be done. Um, certainly from a pho pho photography perspective, in the beginning, a lot of professional photographers were very frightened of Instagram, said it was denigrating their profession and so forth. Now we've got a, a whole genre of people actually doing Instagram on their own. This is a classic example, just quickly, of, of a girl called Nina Kachadurian. She, um, she's just an Instagram photographer, has an amazing following online. Um, these photos were created in an aircraft toilet using uh, napkins and towels and so forth. And she did self-portraits of to, um, to copy sort of like Renaissance-style self-portraits. And she's gained worldwide recognition just from doing Instagram shots of herself doing this. And it's like quite an unusual thing to do, but yeah, that's, that's, that's how easy it is to engage a following. So. Yeah. Um, I think uh, maybe Instagram isn't here to stay, but it, mobile photo sharing is, and Instagram is just the, the vehicle that we're using at the moment. Um, I think, just, I just wanted to mention, Inga talked about 
um, different types of photos you could take in the library. I think we've heard a lot about, for anybody that was NLS 6 or the other uh, sessions that we've heard at online, there's a lot of talk about you know, the physical space of the library and being a maker space. So it's kind of a way of connecting that, the, connecting the physical space of the library online as well. So I think, uh, I think in some form it is here to stay. Uh, yes, I'd have to agree with Joe. I think um, it's photo sharing in some form is going to be around for a very long time. Uh, certainly the thing that I'm looking forward to next is being able to integrate an Instagram photo stream with Vine, which is like a six second video version of Instagram that Twitter has purchased. So I'm looking out for the next new thing. Uh, I definitely agree that Instagram will stay along uh, for, for quite some time. Uh, there was obviously some concern when Facebook uh, actually purchase the company because now it's a subsidiary of them. Um, but, um, but it seems that uh, people, people are dedicated and, uh, and bound to the brand of Instagram and Facebook's efforts to create their own version of it called Facebook Camera have not been successful. So I think uh, that Instagram as the brand will continue on for quite a long time. Okay, well to round off our discussion, we have a video by a presenter who couldn't be here today, Professor Jeff Brand. I'm Jeff Brand, Professor of Communication and Creative Media at Bond University. I research computer game audiences and policy, and I teach classes on digital and interactive media and society. In fact, I'm in class right now. Debates about new media like Instagram come down to questions of affordances. And affordance is simply the property of a thing that provides us with an opportunity to take an action. The most obvious affordance of Instagram is sharing our photos on a social network. But a user who posts photos without any higher purpose hasn't really taken an opportunity and taken full advantage of the affordances for action. Let me explain. Dutch researcher Alki Poles published an article that provides us with a framework we can use for understanding the affordances of Instagram. His article, Characterizing Affordances, was published in the March 2012 edition of the journal Design Studies. Poles explains that the only way we can understand affordances is to experiment with the opportunities for action that a thing offers. He goes on to describe four increasingly complex levels of affordances and I've used Instagram as an example for each of these. So for example, the first level of affordances is simply the opportunity for manipulation. This is low cognition and action only. It doesn't have a higher level of you know, mental processing. Uh, so pressing a shutter button, pressing a share button is an opportunity for manipulation. That's the lowest level of affordances uh, available from Instagram. The next level of affordance is the opportunity for effect. This is the neuropsychological response. If I share a picture, I might feel excitation or feel satisfaction. The next level of affordances from Instagram is opportunities for use. Now this is thinking and planning for a defined purpose. So we're talking about more than just posting a picture. I'm now thinking about building an e-portfolio with Instagram, for example. At the highest level, the highest level of affordances Paul suggests that the opportunity for action, which is the coordinated and social process of using a thing, is absolutely powerful. And in fact, if I give the example for Instagram of, say, 200 students, each taking and posting one picture of a single unique page of a 200-page book, and each hash hashtagging the book title with also the hashtag of the author's name and a hashtag of a page number, all of a sudden, the copyright laws have been thrown into disarray and an entire book has been, ama has been made available on Instagram. So the point I'm trying to make is that at the highest level of affordances, there is this sort of grand opportunity, but it's often disruptive. This is why it's critical that we have debates about the affordances available for tools like Instagram. In the debate, we uncover the highest level of affordances on offer. In libraries, the socio-technical affordances such as images of past exam papers or shelf locations for books or using the automated checkout system to borrow something from the library's collection is a number of examples of the affordances of Instagram for libraries. And it doesn't take too long to innovate the affordances that are available to us with this amazing tool. 
Personally, I'd like to see the library's coffee shop menu, hashtag papyrus, shot with a sepia filter. Thanks for listening. So I ran out and did that straight away as soon as I saw Jeff's video. Um, and it got five likes that afternoon. Needs hot so, chips on it. Yeah. <laughs> it's just the coffee menu. <laughs> um, I just thought, just to conclude, I'll just share this uh, quote from Edwin Land, the Polaroid creator. Photography should go beyond amusement and record making to become a continuous partner of most human beings. So I think this is what Instagram is doing. It's, it's created a language for, for individuals, but it's also a way for, for libraries to try something different in the library. <coughs> okay, so we're going to open it up for a question and answer now from the audience. Um, does anybody have any questions? Um, this is for anyone on the panel. Um, did you have any difficulty or did you need to engage your executive um, in um, putting up your Instagram account? Um, and how did you obtain that support from executive management? Um, maybe I could answer that mm -hmm. one. Um, I'm a librarian and we originally started using, I was using my personal Instagram account to create content for Facebook because uh, we knew that images were getting much more attention on our Facebook page, so we started, I was using, just posting photos on my own Instagram account and then sharing them to Facebook. Mm -hmm. And then uh, as we sort of talked about it, we thought, oh, well, why don't we just have our own Bond Library account? Um, and then as we, uh, it sort of slowly, it took off by itself. So I think its value was fairly evident and um, managers and uh, bosses at work were very supportive so um, in my experience there wasn't any there wasn't any friction we had um, uh, so I work in the central marketing team where um, basically we work with um, each of the business units around mm -hmm. campus to um, utilize social media and so we had basically given the library implied um, permission to use social media from um, helping them launch um, their uh, Facebook page Okay. And does Bond University have a fairly robust um, social media policy that underpins? Um, we do yeah. have um, two, th two sets of documents. One is more around guidelines and do's and don'ts, um, basically just to um, uh, help people understand and then utilise it um, fairly quickly. Um, we have in development, um, pretty much as we speak, a more um, comprehensive social media policy which then also touches upon um, student guidelines um, in terms of being a student within the campus. Excellent. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, I'll share it on Twitter after the account, but it's just... Um, the Bond Library one is just at Bond Library, all one word. And I believe Bond University is just Bond University. That's correct. At Bond yep. University, yeah. Yep. Well, if there are no further questions, I'm going to throw it open to the panel to give a final comment if they have anything they'd like to say. We'll start on the right. So, Mitchell, is there any last comments? Um, I think, uh, you put me on the spot. <laughs> um, I think uh, that, uh, I, I think I've covered everything. <laughs> Peter? I'll just say go out and get your hands dirty and start taking some photos and have a play. It's fun. Yeah, I'd agree with Peter. It's, it's a really good opportunity to be creative and you've got the tools there to try something different. So it is fun. And very low cost. Yes, yeah. that's true. <laughs> yeah, I actually do agree and I think it's, um, it, it is a really, really good platform for making a place that a lot of people seem to be a little bit sort of like not as interesting to make it into a really interesting place because those basic libraries are fascinating and um, it's if you can get a more engaged user um, community through a social network like um, Instagram then all power to you I think it's fantastic um, it makes it a, a nicer sort of thing and it's, you can then sort of like leverage off it and um, create more sort of publicity for your individual events that you might have like special talk speakers in libraries and so forth um, I say that the actual um, ways you could use Instagram is only limited to your imagination really, providing you don't sort of like go over the, the copyright and the personal, um, you know, the personal uh, guidelines that would step on people's toes. Um, yeah, but I say get out there. <laughs>
Yeah, um, I'll follow the same sentiment. Get excited about it. This is a great opportunity to use something that doesn't cost you anything to do something really extraordinary. Um, whether it's being creative in the way that you respond or engage discussions with your students and with other staff members. And it's also an opportunity to raise a profile of your um, business unit within the university. Um, and you might find that um, you can get all sorts of positive um, consequences out of doing something amazing with Instagram. So good luck.